My guest is Roger Savory, who is an ecologist, a consultant to landowners, and an authority in holistic management. Today, we're going to talk about holistic management. Roger, how are you today? Hi, Hot. I'm good. Even when I'm bad, I'm good. Sounds great. Roger, tell us, what is holistic management? Um, I don't really think holistic management is anything, but uh, what we call holistic management is a different method of making decisions. And it's a different method of making decisions based on Jan Smuts, who wrote a book called Holism and Evolution. Hmm. Um, I think it was 1936, if I rem remember rightly. And in it, he told uh, the world's experts that we would not understand the world until we realized that it functioned in holes and patterns and spirituality. Um, and uh, so when we stepped back and looked at the world again through different lenses, um, we realized that, yes, it really does function in holes and patterns and, uh, and humans have a deep spirituality. And, uh, and when we understand the holes and patterns and stop thinking linearly, then, uh, then we, we just have more success in management. So how was holistic management developed? So it's, it's been a long journey. So obviously Jan Smuts came up uh, with, the pat, with the idea of holism and evolution in 1936. But you have to look back at who Jan Smuts was. <clears throat> so when he was 16 years old, he was a Boer general fighting the, the world's greatest empire, the English empire. So as a 16-year-old Boer general, he excuse my French, but he kicked the British's butt up and down South Africa. He um, pioneered the commando troops. Uh, he led, led guerrilla forces behind enemy lines and attacked the British rail systems all the way down in the Cape, you know, thousands of kilometers from where the actual battle was. Um, so he was a, a brilliant um, tactician and, uh, and, and thinker. He was educated in the United Kingdom at uh, top British universities. I think it was Cambridge, if, if I remember rightly. And come World War I, he was so respected by the British that they actually made him a English general. So imagine taking your enemy from the last war and making him your general in the next war. You only do that if you have a deep level of respect for the gentleman. After World War I, he was instrumental in creating the League of Nations. Um, and the League of Nations, uh, he, and he was the one who said, if we ask Germany for reparations, I guarantee we'll be in another war within 20 years. Hmm. The world didn't listen to him. He was just a young man. And exactly as predicted, within 20 years, we were in war with Germany again. During World War II, the British made him a field marshal. He was Field Marshal Jan Smuts. And at the end of World War II, he was such a famous and well-loved Field Marshal that New York City gave him a ticker tape parade in New York City at the end of the war. Now, how is it the man that was so famous has so been forgotten by history? It's just amazing. The next thing he did was he created the United Nations um, after World War II. So a, a really deep thinker, but, uh, but he was a farm boy growing up and he, and he understood nature and he understood people and he, he was just a deep thinker. So holism and evolution is what we respect him for, but you can see all his thinking was military. Uh, he was a lawyer by profession, law, military, strategy, biology, and he was able to think about everything together. I think he was one of those uh, really deep thinkers that the planet has every now and again. I think the one 2,000 years earlier was called Jesus. Um, but, um, but he was a deep thinker. And so he came up with that um, in 1936. Then um, my father, Alan Savory, he read his work, was obviously very impressed. Um, Alan was a uh, uh, special forces military member of parliament trying to bring a civil war to an end, also grappling with biological issues. 
And when he uh, read it, he saw the connection. And so then holistic management developed from this idea of we needed to understand the whole to understand the parts. And then when looking at the complexity of how do we manage these complex systems, um, the British military um, system developed at Sandhurst for battlefield planning in chaos and, um, and stuff like that was adopted into holistic management in what was called the holistic grazing plan. And these grazing planning charts were, are actually identical to what the British military used for 800 years to conquer the world. So it's a very good method of getting the chaos of battle. Oh, these guys are attacking from here. These guys have run out of raw material. We need fuel. We need ammunition. We need troops moved. How do you put all this complexity into one plan so that all your generals and everyone understand it? So that complexity was then um, put into um, holistic management. And that was kind of the step one. And then there was the understanding of the need for... Um, for managing finances. So then holistic financial planning was developed. And then um, as it's progressed since about 1984, it's, 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 it's never stood still. It's, it's, it's a work in progress as we think more deeply about it and think about what it means. So what is holistic management today? Well, it's nothing more than a decision-making framework. And we make all our decisions based on the quality of life we desire, and the future landscape description, how we would need life to be in the future to allow our great grandchildren to be living the same high quality of life, socially, economically, and environmentally. And, uh, and that because humans think linearly, we have to try and think about numerous things simultaneously. So in a nutshell, all holistic management is, is a different way of thinking and managing our resources and our lives. You may have already answered this, but who can benefit from using holistic management? Um, Hart, this is very difficult to say without sounding like the most arrogant individual on the planet. But I truly believe this. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been watching others do it for 30 years. I've watched the incredible changes happen on all the continents of the planet. I've lived in 64 countries myself. If all humans don't start doing this and start doing this soon, we're all actually doomed to extinction. So governments have got to do it. Families have got to do it. Mining corporations have got to do it. Family farmers have got to do it. Schools have got to do it. So who? Everyone. Now, we concentrated with farming families in the beginning because we had to think about well, what's the low hanging fruit and what is the most important group to understand this concept to buy us the most time for getting the rest of humanity to understand it. And we realize that those producing our food and those currently turning the desert, the world into a desert um, through the unstoppable process of, desert, of global desertification, what we now call climate change, we understood that we had to start working with people at the grassroots who produce our food and who produce our deserts. So once we could convince them that if they just changed how they made decisions, we no longer had this unstoppable train wreck of desertification, we could reverse it um, and regenerate it. So you'll hear a lot of people now talking about regenerative holistic um, agriculture. That's just a reframing of the words holistic management. What is context and why is it important? So, you know, it's so simple. Um, when, when I explain it, you'll go, you know, that's, that's so obvious. We, we knew this all along, except you didn't. So um, if I ask a very simple question um, of you, Hart, I say, Hart, should we, should we light a fire? It depends. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I asked. I said, should we light a fire? It's an unanswerable question unless you know, um, you know, unless you know the context. Unless you know the context. Exactly. Right. So currently, nearly every decision we make in life, we make without a context. Mm. 
And if we had to analyze it, nearly every decision we make, we make towards solving a problem without understanding the context within which we're solving a problem. So I'll come back to the fire question. Uh, it looks like your house might be nice wood with drywall. Yeah, if you make a fire behind you, uh, no, your house is burning down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should we light a fire? No, but it looks like there's a fireplace behind you. Mm -hmm. So maybe if the context was it's cold, it's wintry, it's snowing outside, then the context is within a snow cold environment, should we light a fire within our fireplace? Well, the, the, then it becomes very easy to know within that context, the answer is yes. Now, if you were hungry and you needed to cook your food, should we light a fire to cook our food? Yes, within that context, that's the right. But if I just ask you the blanket statement, should we light the fire? You don't know. Well, it's the same for everything. Um, all the decisions we make, all the policies government come up with, they don't come up with them within a context. They just come up, they, they mistake the problem mm -hmm. for the context. Mm -hmm. You see, and so when we just widen our horizon just a little bit and state what the context is within which we're making a decision, then it just becomes so easy to make the decision. Now, what a holistic context is, as opposed to a context, a holistic context, we just say that for every decision we make, we're going to describe what we would like our family, society and culture to look like. That's the one leg of the three-legged stool. We then describe what resources and income and profits we would need to maintain that family and community. That's the second leg of the stool. And then the third leg of the stool is for us to have that quality of life and for us to generate that income and that profit to live that quality of life, what would our environment 500 years into the future need to look like? Now, I've done this for 35 years. I've never had someone say, in the future, I want to live in a desert with blowing sands, no flowing rivers, pollution everywhere, air that I can't breathe. Um, no one's ever described that as the future environment. Everyone describes wanting clear flowing rivers, wildlife, abundance of nature, abundance of, of plants, clean air, birds, bees, flowers. Everyone describes that as the environment they want to live in. So why every day do we plow up 400 million acres of America and turn it into just bare blowing sand? Why do we have trains crashing and billowing millions of tons of toxic fumes into the air? Why do we build nuclear bombs to blow the planet to smithereens? Where in our context of describing the future environment, did we say, no, we wanted air we can't breathe. We wanted soil that was bare and lifeless. Um, and we wanted a, uh, an atmosphere that's so toxic to life that no life forms can live on it because it's you know, got nuclear radiation in it. We never once described that. So why are we making decisions towards solving a problem that are creating that? So a holistic context then describes our society and culture and family, the income we need, and then what the environment would have to look like. You cannot support any society and any economy if the, the world's atmosphere is full of nuclear radiation. Mm -mm. You just can't do it. So how did that become our decision to proliferate nukes? You cannot support any community, any society or any economy with air so full of toxins that people can't breathe and can't live and fish die in rivers. So how did that become our decision? You cannot support any economy or any society with bare blowing sands. America already has 81 million acres of desert. 
200 million acres are at risk of turning into desert within the next 70 years. The other 200, sorry, the other 400 million acres is uh, considered at risk of desertification in the next 70 years and becoming unable to grow crops. Where? Where do we think a context where we're making decisions towards cre creating that can support us economically and socially into the future? Well, as soon as we say that, we, we sound really clever and we make everyone else sound really foolish. I'm not trying to make everyone fo sound foolish. I'm just saying, people, stop making decisions towards solving a problem. Mm -hmm. Back off, create the context, describe the future you would like, and then only then decide how to solve your problem. So for example, right now, oh, there's pests in my garden, there's grasshoppers eating everything. Without the context, get DDT and bomb the hell out of them grasshoppers, we're gonna kill them. Mm -hmm. Without the context, using DDT to kill grasshoppers was a totally viable option. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as soon as I had a context and I said, in the future, I want to see butterflies, birds, bees, and everything. Well, shit, DDT also kills all of those things. What's going to pollinate our trees if all the insects are dead? No, I just wanted to kill the grasshoppers. I didn't want to kill everything. But you see, without a context, I had a solution to a problem, grasshoppers, that unknowingly killed everything. And it wasn't until Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring that she warned us and she didn't even warn us of a context, but she painted a picture mm -hmm. of the environmental side of the context that made us all sit up and go, no, that's not what we want. We've never wanted that. Oh, my God, let's stop doing that. Mm -hmm. So we made a law to outlaw DDT because we thought that was the problem. And we immediately replaced DDT with even worse chemicals. Why? Because we still had not created the context the holistic context where we described our society, we described our economy, and we described the future environment. So we have to learn as a globe, as global citizens, to create holistic contexts, socially, economically, and environmentally, and then, and only then make resolutions, make policies to solve problems within the context. So Roger, this has been an enlightening conversation about holistic management. What can people do? Um, Hart, for any change to take place, we've got to start with the children. So, um, and we know this from all the research, we're in a race against time. So we have to get this knowledge of holistic management into our education system in all the Western and non-Western countries. Uh, the knowledge is there, there are books written, there's people who produce children's education. We've just got to make a conscious decision to get it into all the PTAs and all the schools you know, across the world. That's step one. The second step is we've got to um, put on training programs for government cabinets and uh, congressmen and senators for all the governments around the world. It is literally, we can train a government in one week. In one week, we can train a government how to create a national holistic context for the nation and then for the senators, congressmen, cabinet, whichever, whether you're in parliamentary system or a congressional system, for the leaders to then utilize that national holistic context to then analyze all their own policies to make sure their policies are being written within their national holistic context and not within the context of solving a problem. It really is something very easy. We've just, as the citizens of the world, we've just got to demand it of our leaders. Right now, they're fearful because you're fearful of the unknown. But I mean, it really is nothing to be scared of. Once you've got your national holistic context, you make all your decisions the exact same way you always have. It's not a cult. It's not a personality. It's just, hey, let's look at the big picture. Okay, now within our nation, solving that problem, now that we have looked at the big picture, will this in effect 
um, help us solve it. And then within the, um, the, the context and holistic management, we have, uh, you know, I'm getting old, but I think we've got uh, the nine testing uh, or filtering questions that we use to just analyze that every policy will actually take us in the direction um, we want to go. It's really, really simple. We teach villagers with no education in Africa how to do this. Mm. Um, you know, we can teach a government within one week. It's not difficult. But like Winston Churchill said, when all the experts say it can't be done, find new experts. Well, our civilization is on the verge of collapse. We're all seeing the problems. I believe we have a solution. Talk to us. There are enough people trained in holistic management globally to get this knowledge into cabinets and it'll be rudimentary. It'll be like riding a tricycle at the beginning until people you know, grapple with it, think more about it. But the initial thing can be done very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna quote Churchill again, because he said, until all men are governed well, none are. Um, and, and I believe it's because we've never understood the context within which we're making decisions. And Smuts talked to us about it over a century ago. And I think we need to listen to him and uh, pay attention and think about what we want spiritually and then look at the holes and the patterns and, uh, and just create national holistic context at a governmental level, at family levels, at farm levels, at mining company levels. One of the big mining companies uh, you know, got this training 20 or 30 years ago. And I look at their policies and they're fantastic policies and no one understands why, but the board were all trained about, you know, it's about 25 years ago. So, um, you know, so we know it works and we know it works long-term because the companies that did get trained a long time ago are doing well. Um, so yeah, bottom line, how do we go forward? Encourage your Senator, encourage your con congressional um, thing. Buy the book on holistic management, read, um, Read IPA, Independent Parties of America, um, on Facebook uh, for, for how you create um, political parties based on holistic contexts. You know, the answers are out there if people want it. Sounds like the world needs holistic management. Roger Savory, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Hart.